Welcome to the New Human Movement. I'm Gary Hamill, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Michele Zanini. And as always, we have an amazing uh, guest today, and we're going to have a great conversation. Uh, we are joined uh, today by Tracy Davidson. Tracy is Deputy CEO of Handelsbanken, the uh, Stockholm-based uh, Northern European Bank, Deputy CEO of Handelsbanken uh, UK. She also chairs uh, the bank's wealth and asset uh, 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 management uh, uh, business. And uh, Tracy has been with, with Handelsbanken since 2003, so really understands the bank deeply. She was instrumental uh, in growing the bank's uh, a business in the UK, which is now a substantial part of Handelsbanken. Uh, before joining the bank, she worked at Barclays, so she has deep history in financial services and uh, can, can help us understand what is truly unique and different about Handelsbanken. So uh, as you may know, Michaela and I, uh, we, 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 we like to ferret out uh, organizations that kind of defy the bureaucratic rules that manage in a different sort of way. And that's the conversation we're going to be having today. And I let me let me just give you kind of a quick orientation to Handel's Bank. And if you really don't know much about the bank, so let's just lay out some facts and then we'll we'll get uh, Tracy here to kind of expound. Uh, but it's 150 years old uh, this year, so hardly a spring chicken. Uh, operates in more than 20 countries, mostly across Northern Europe, uh, roughly uh, 700 plus branches, 12,000 uh, uh, employees. Uh, it covers the full spectrum of banking uh, services, corporate banking, asset management, and, and, and retail banking. And uh, you know has 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 a market uh, value at the moment of about 23 billion U.S. dollars. Now, what makes the bank amazing, and why we're so pleased to have Tracy? We're going to kind of dig into this. Let me just share just a little bit of data with you on this, if I can. If you look at Handelsbanken's performance, now this is over the last decade, and you can see here a variety of different metrics that that uh, you know we use to look at the performance of financial institutions cost income ratio, SGNA as a percentage of revenue. I'm not going to go through all of these things. You can kind of glance at them, but 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 you will see here that when compared to its European peer group, on virtually every measure of performance, Handelsbanken has been outperforming. And by the way, this is not only over the last uh, decade. Uh, Handelsbanken has, has beat its European peer group on average, I think every year for the last 49 or, or 50 years. This is just like extraordinary uh, performance, which really makes it worthwhile to dig in and understand what does it take to build an institution that, that can year after year deliver these kinds of results. So that's enough kind of by background. Tracy, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me, Gary. Nice to see you again and you, Michaeli. So maybe let's let's just dig in. You know, you you've obviously worked across financial services, uh, uh, Tracy. So, what attracted you to Handelsbank and 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 to help our readers? You know, for trying to explain that that performance, what would you point to? What really makes this bank uh, uh, different from its peers? Wow, why did I join them? Well, um, when I when I was first um, approached back in uh, the early 2000s, obviously I did a little bit of research and, and um, some of the things that you pulled on there really resonated with me then. So um, you mentioned Barclays, my previous employer, a fantastic company, really did enjoy my corporate career with them. Um, and Handelsbank and offered something different. So when I first started to meet people who worked in Handelsbank, and we were very small in the UK then, uh, they would say things to me like, you know what, your voice is really heard here. Um, you are able to use your brain fully to do your job. Um, it's a very satisfying to be a banker for Handelsbank because you can use all the skills you've learned everywhere else and take responsibility for it. Um, everybody was motivated. And I, I can remember saying to my husband, I'm either going to work for the best bank in the world or they're all Stepford wives because they all say the same thing. It was the former, by the way, not the latter. <laughs> And I think the thing that makes us different um, is that business model. It is an empowered business model. We often describe it um, as being a um, um, decentralized, um, empowered model. Uh, we talked before, haven't we, about our culture of trusting our employees to do the right thing. But we make our decisions closest to our customers and we don't put layers and bureaucracy in place for organizational sake. In fact, we, we try and find ways to remove those to make ourselves more effective and more efficient and make little entrepreneurs of all of our employees so that they can drive the success of all of our activities towards our one corporate goal. So if I can just ask on, on those two points, 
so you said, you know, kind of less heavyweight corporate structures and more empowerment. So maybe, Tracy, just talk to us for a moment. What would be, uh, in, in what ways are people working on, on the front lines, I presume in branches, in, in what ways are they empowered uh, in ways that might not be true in other financial institutions? And if, and if I look at the corporate center and so on, in what way is that slimmer or flatter or less uh, oppressive, if, if I can use that word, than, than what may, might be found in, in other institutions? Maybe just, just unpack that a little bit with a, with a few details and examples. Okay, um, so if we if I pick up a perfect example of what we do at branches that perhaps are, are we wouldn't see in other banks and certainly wasn't my experience at my previous employer, and that's that's grant credits, that's lending money. So right now, um, well over ninety percent of all of our lending decisions are made in the branch by staff in the branch who have a direct relationship with their customer, and they go through all the experiences with that customer from um, welcoming them to us as a handles banking customer in the first place, uh, to lending them money and also supporting them if they have difficult times. Um, we don't have any central place where we move difficult credits to be managed by specialists. That gets done at the branch. So we have a, a direct relationship there that puts the empowerment with the employees in the branch. It puts the responsibility there. They, they have a real vested interest to fix and help that customer with their problem, which we know and has proven over decades, as you've seen by the results there, that produces the best results for our bank um, and, of course, delivers the best service for our customers. And then one of the things that's specifically different around our, our head office organization is we don't centralize things that, that make a difference to our customers. So we don't have a centralized marketing budget or a centralized marketing team that determine that Handels Bank will sponsor something um, for a return. Uh, we leave that to the branches. So if the branches think that supporting a, um, an, um, an endeavor local to them is the right thing to do for their business development or for their profile in the community, that's their decision. Um, we don't do that centrally at all. So there is no big central marketing department in Handels Bank. So does that does that suggest that each one of these branches has its kind of own own P and L? Because I, I guess that in a lot of financial institutions uh, and maybe in a lot of organizations generally, people the front lines they're not really running anything that feels like a business. It doesn't have a P and L. They have some synthetic targets, KPIs, and so on for cross selling or customer satisfaction, whatever it may be. But it sounds to me like these these people really are are running things that are like 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 businesses and 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 they have control over many of those key decisions yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the most important things you do as a branch manager in Handels Bank is log on and look at your P&L every morning. You go and see you go and see what your business is doing. Um, and they also are um, encouraged to challenge how um, they are they are charged for the services they buy off the rest of the bank. So if we um, if we supply something from from them centrally, then the branch is charged for it. And we actively have mechanisms for the, the branch network to get involved in challenging those costs to say, what do I get for that? Is that good value? Is, is that the right thing for us to be doing? Um, so we have a, an internal marketplace almost that keeps us all on our toes because the if, you, if the branch strives to be successful in its local marketplace and drive new business and it controls its cost, it will ultimately be more and more successful driving to our common corporate goal, which is to, to have a higher return on equity or a higher profitability than the average of our peers in our home markets. So driving, driving good business, managing your costs, um, that's how a branch is successful. And ultimately, that's how our bank is successful. What, what, what feels different about this bank to a customer? Uh, and by the way, I've, I've been a customer of Barclays since 1983, and they're pretty good. But, but what feels different to a customer about the experience of Handelsbanken? Well, whenever I've spoken direct to customers or read feedback from our surveys, um, what you'll hear is they have a relation. They genuinely have a relationship with their branch. They'll say things like, when I, when I call my branch, they know who I am. Um, when I have an issue, I deal with the same people. Um, when I talk about my business, that they know my business, they come in and see me or they, they, they walk past me. Or I was referred to Handles Bank and buy my friend, my colleague, my, my neighbor. Um, so they, they have a connection, a physical connection to, to the bank that says, this is different because if I want to borrow some money from 
hey, another branch, bank, I need to um, go to a call center or um, I, the person in the bank isn't the person who makes the decision. Uh, but here you can sit down and you can have a conversation. And more recently, you can do that over uh, video conferencing, obviously. But it's the same idea. It's that genuine relationship. But much with more intimate, personal. I mean, I heard maybe this is apocryphal, but I heard that uh, branch uh, managers will give their their personal cell phone numbers to their customers. Is that could that ever was that happen? Yeah, it's it's happened. It definitely has happened, and they've also gone out of their way when a customer's been in difficulty. You know, they um, they they do they do support and and um, take care of their customers in some extraordinary ways. You know, I had a one one colleague uh, told a, a business customer of theirs was flying briefly through Heathrow. Normally, live in the Midlands, flying through Heathrow had a small window of opportunity and desperately needed to close a property deal. Um, this branch manager got in the car, drove to Heathrow, going, went into the airport with the paperwork, bought a, bought a cup of coffee at the little coffee shop and sat and did the business with them. And then they flew off to where they were going and then the branch manager drove back. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, real, it's a really lovely feeling when a customer realizes that their business with us is that important, that they would go out of their way to do that. And I guess that shows up in in your your customer satisfaction scores. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. We were very, very proud and humbled by the customer satisfaction scores led by those interactions with the branch employees. Um, and, and these are the kinds of feedback you get from them. So it's uh, well, something where we jealously, jealously guard and work hard on every year. Yeah. And they're not just slightly better than the than the average. They're better by leaps and bounds, right? So it's like a, a, a completely different level of customer satisfaction from, from the industry, which is amazing. So Tracy, there's so much that I'd love to unpack, but maybe one of the things that might be really interesting to talk a little bit more about is the credit decision process you mentioned earlier, because you know, for people who are not familiar with, with banking, the, the, what you described is goes so much against the grain of conventional wisdom, right, in banking. And, and so... People might object or say, well, you know, if you give us so much authority to people at the, at the front line, you might get two, two problems. One, you know, bad decisions just because, you know, you are, you know, you don't have all the information and you're just maybe not, uh, not skilled. And, you know, and there, and there have been during the financial crisis this in the U.S., a lot of examples of people, uh, you know, asking for, you know, generating loans that were bad, and, and eventually they hit the the balance sheet of the bank, and you know, several years later. So, how do you deal with 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 that? And then the second question, the second objection might be, you know, why do you have people who are very fallible, who are, you know, don't have all the information? Why do you make them uh, give them so much authority? Wouldn't it be better to have pros at the center who use algorithms and fancy models? To, 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 to decide what's best? Oh, lovely question, Kaylee. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, oof, where do I start? Um, there, are, there are many different models out there. So, so my, uh, my current, um, our current way of working or our way of working with, with credits is that the, the, on the belief that the person closest to the customer genuinely knows what's going on. So first of all, of course, our, our bankers who, who degree credit decisions are very trained. They understand how to analyze a credit proposition. They, they, um, they have years of experience with us, maybe with another bank. Um, they are supported, of course, by, um, by experts if there is a need for an expert um, input in it. And they would look at an a proposition and analyze it thoroughly. Um, they would also do the, um, the, the human test that says, does this sound reasonable? Um, we, may have, we may have talked about before the fact that we, we don't use bonuses in Handelsbanken. And one of the reasons we don't do that is we really want our colleagues to make the right decision, the right decision for the bank and the right decision for the customer. And that might mean saying no. So you have a huge opportunity. It's going to make the bank a lot of money. It looks really good, but something doesn't feel right. You know, maybe it's a new business that says they're making um, multi-million pounds of turnover and you've driven past it 10 times this week and there's nobody in the showroom. There's something not right there. 
So we want our employees to say no and to know that that's the right thing to do. So we don't we don't drive people's behavior through bonuses. But then we also um, support the analysis and ensure that they have access to data and information that they may need in order to make the right decisions. And then to be very careful, we ensure that we follow that up and we make sure that fits within the bank's framework and that we can see that that looks like a healthy and, and good lending decision. If you compare it to the other one, you, the, the other way of doing it is to take that responsibility away from the employees who sit next to the customers and perhaps for a minute presume somebody in a city 100 miles away has a better judgment than the person who's driving past that showroom every day. And we don't agree. We don't think that's right. It's the person who, who sees that has the better judgment. And then you can use algorithms, but then algorithms don't drive past showrooms either. Um, and they don't talk to people and bring in that network. So we, we believe that a three-dimensional approach or even four-dimensional approach to lending is a good one. So there's the person, there's the analysis, there's the, um, the local information um, and the ability to, when it comes to it, trust your gut as well. You know, I mean, obviously, there's such a big emphasis today on using data and analytics. But but when you use data, you know, data only captures part of reality. You have to make, you know, what data what data are 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 you uh, uh, collecting? And then, of course, that gets summarized and collapsed as you move up, you know, the organization. So I guess what 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 I hear you saying is that you've moved decision making down to people who have that contextual information, who are there, close to customer, close to reality. And, and they have, you know, and, and, and that there's an advantage in getting better decisions than kind of moving data up to where, you know, people aren't that aware and that kind of uh, close to the customer and close to the reality. Absolutely. And we did it decades ago. So when you look at our credit loss ratio, that's that's actually um, the proof of how our model is working over over decades of work. But the other thing, and I can speak for if I put my hat on when I was a branch manager once and I was agreeing these facilities, when I looked at a customer's um, requirement and was talking to them, I'm thinking, how will this feel in five years time? How will this customer fare if interest rates go up by 1% or 2%? Um, how, will they, how will they cope when this event, such as a, a retirement or a, a family event, happens in their future? And, and how will I feel if I'm dealing with them if something's gone wrong? Uh, so I'm, I'm, tr I'm walking, this is standard, this is how we work with credit assessments, is we, we think about all of those scenarios, because we want this to be the right decision for the customer in the long term. The, the most successful thing of a, of a lending decision is a successful repayment at the end, where everybody had a very smooth journey and it worked out exactly how they wanted, and the customers got what they needed out of the process. So we, we, we play that through in our heads. And then we also then look at um, how how the, um, the, um, the economic cycle might affect that situation. And we, we take that conversation with the customer again, because sometimes we need to say no, that we actually think this is too much risk for you and, and it isn't going to achieve what you want because you will undertake financial strain that you can't accommodate. Well, that was a perfect uh, uh, example of how you localize the trade-off, right? You were as a branch manager thinking in the particular instance about what might happen and playing through the whole the whole scenario going forward, because by the way, you know you're not gonna you know, if the uh, loan goes south, you're not gonna kick it upstairs as a debt workout unit. There is no debt workout unit, right? At a handles market, yeah. and 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 so you know, which is in a way like not to go back to our book, but why we wanted to feature Handelsbank in, in the uh, principle on paradox, right? Because you, you're you showing how, yeah, you know, it, you can have the, the cake and eat it too, right? You, you can be disciplined and be efficient and at the same time, you know, encourage people to exercise their, their judgment. Um, and, you know, maybe we can leave uh, the credit uh, process here, but just one societal remark I might also make. I, I came across a book called uh, The Myth of uh, uh, the Meritocracy Trap by um, uh, professor at Yale, and he had an example of the U.S. about the crapification, if you excuse my language, of, of jobs. And one example he had was loan officers and how in the U.S. loan officers used to be a middle class job that paid a decent amount of money and, you know, required training and skills that would be exercised and so on. I think a little bit like the, the way it, it works at Handelsbank and everywhere, but that over time, you know, that profession, that occupation has been stripped 
of all those things and it pays less and it's less secure and it's less interesting. And so, you know, you can imagine taking your model and applying it not only to loan officers, but more broadly. And, you know, what kind of jobs can we create uh, and what kind of fulfillment can we have? Well, what kind of value can we can we create for customers if we, you know, <laughs> emulated handles banking a little bit more? You think about banking, it's, we, we're in our business of taking credit risk. We lend money as part of our business model. So if you do that as well as you possibly can, then you are engineering a good outcome for your shareholders and your customers. And our, all of our branch employees understand how Handels Bank does credit risk. They understand our appetite, they work within those frameworks, and then we give them the support to do that and, and obviously take good care that that, that is carried through. Uh, Tracy, I'd like to pick up on Michaela's point there uh, and something we've written about, about the bank, you talked about managing paradox and, and maybe get you to comment on this for a moment. Um, I, I believe that Hollisbanken got through the last big financial crisis, 2008, 2009, relatively unscathed, obviously a big economic impact, but relatively unscathed compared to its peers. And it seems to me, you know, when, when you look at banks in general, what you see is it, it always seems like uh, you know, to grow above average, you have to take above average risks. So that almost seems like a fact of banking that the only way to outgrow your peers is you got to be willing to take more risk. And sooner or later, that kind of rebound, you know, comes back on you and and, and you're in trouble. And, and, and every decade or so, you see a lot of bankers like all, all jump off a cliff and it may be Russian debt or a dot-com boom or subprime mortgage, whatever. How is it that 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 Handelsbank can kind of got through this without uh, and 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 has both managed to grow faster than many of its peers, but also taking less risk? That seems like almost an impossibility in banking. How has that happened? Well, um, as ever, good question. I think I'd reflect on the fact that um, Handelsbank very much knows who it is as a, as an institution. We understand um, what we're good at, and we are. We're brave enough, um, and our, our, um, our, leg, our history has shown, we're brave enough to stick to what we know and what we want to do and like to do. Um, and that means that sometimes we, likewise, we say no to opportunities. If it doesn't fit with our core business model, if it doesn't make sense to us from a long-term re um, return basis, then we wouldn't go and expand our operation in order to do it. So we're a bank, we're a relationship bank, we do core banking activities. Um, and from time to time, if opportunities present themselves to take us off in a good remunerative level or to go against some of those principles, we have a very strong um, um, culture that, that pulls us back from those situations that says, really, is that is that actually the right thing that we need to do for the bank? Um, and sometimes you need to be brave and say no to the most popular way. When people are going in a different direction and saying, let's go over here, let's drop our standards, let's take more risk, then we need to stick to our principle that says we're here for a long-term, sustainable, secure institution built on principles that 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 endure, um, and that's in that's in our um, our way of doing things. That's in our corporate culture that we take those those stances. And I think what you might also then see is that. Um, it's not that we've accelerated or grown significantly faster than others, that perhaps we just haven't gone backwards at times when others have, uh, because we're in, in it for a steady and strong and stable um, banking performance rather than um, a um, win at all costs, perhaps I can say. But it seems to me, and, and this is, and just correct me if I have kind of the wrong diagnosis here, but it seems that through the financial crisis, there are a lot of banks in which you know you had you had a group of people responsible for for growth and for creating new products, credit default swaps, and and whatever these things are, CDOs and so on, and they were remunerated almost totally on just like shovel this product out the door and grow the top line. And then somewhere else you have like this risk management function that's kind of like hold the reins on the horses and and prevent you know this thing from running away. And what it sounds like to us is that in Hannesbanken, every single person working in a branch. And every single person making those credit decisions is also a risk manager. There's somehow, you know, rather than having these as as two warring camps, or you know, uh, and 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 hoping that the the, the risk department can somehow, uh, you know, uh, uh, whole, whole, you know, uh, protect the bank from from uh, you know the the animal spirits of its of its uh, traders and so on. That at Hausbanken, everybody feels accountable for for managing the risk. Is that is that fair? 
I'd, I'd absolutely say so. And I think um, I, I'd, all, I'd, I'd translate it into our languages. We all know what our corporate goal is and we all know how we should go about doing that. And within that is that we don't take risks for short term gains. We're not into it. We don't we don't look for that. It's not something that's part of our makeup. We develop products that customers ask us for. We don't sell products that people make because they think it's a good opportunity. We we address what our customers need. We keep that central to everything that we do. And over the years, so 17 years I've been with Handels Bank and, and every time um, I'm I reminded when um, opportunities come along, obviously I'm not in the room at the time, but we have a very strong board that stick to our um, to our corporate ethos um, and who support us working in this way by keeping our goal constant, by keeping keeping the way in which we uh, focus on the customers as the core in which we, we operate. And that allows everyone in the company to understand why we're here and how we should go about doing our daily job. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. There's more of it to come. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire, the world's largest appliance maker and a global leader in the Internet of Things, for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. It's great to work with a partner who is so deeply committed to building organizations that elicit and deserve the very best that human beings can give. Now, back to our conversation. So, so Tracy, I I wanted to uh, maybe pose a double barrel questions again, honing in on a couple of practices that are signature practices of Handelsbank. And one is, you know, the... um, the, the, the pressure that central services, central functions feel from the branches to keep costs down and service high service levels high. You alluded to it earlier. I would wonder, I was, I'd love for you to unpack that maybe briefly with an example. So, because the, again, that's, you know, pretty unheard of, you know, uh, of, 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 of staff functions being so accountable to, to the branches and to the, to the frontline units. And then the second is compensation. You mentioned that uh, um, Handelsbank doesn't pay bonuses. And you know, there's a really important role that uh, profit sharing plays, right? Um, the Octagon Golden Program. So, could could you, you know, in a few minutes, maybe just give us a bit of an overview of, of both of those things? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the central the central cost thing. Um, so. It, the branch manager in the morning, as I used to do uh, back in the day, I'd open my PL and I'd have a look, and then there would be perhaps a, a surprise charge just gone to my PL, and I, I don't know what it is. Um, so I'll obviously try and find out what that cost is about and why is that relevant and, and why is it being charged to my branch. Um, and I'm always hoping it's a mistake, by the way. That's that you're always thinking, oh, hopefully this charge isn't for me. Um, but then you say, well, uh, you get together as a group of branch managers and you say, well, you know, we're paying however many thousands of pounds for for this service. Um, so maybe it's um, a piece of um, hardware that's being supplied by the head office. Um, and, and I've been in many conversations where somebody will say, do you know that piece of equipment? You charge me one thousand pounds for it. I know I can get it down at my local store for five hundred pounds. You know, why can I go and buy it from my local store and save the bank five hundred pounds? Because that goes straight to the bottom line and affects the cost income ratio. So these are real life conversations that go on all the time. And we have a mechanism once a year for groups of people to challenge the central departments and say, how are you running? How how are you controlling the costs that you will then pass on to me? So this is this is in our DNA. We are we are a a whole company full of bargain doers, you know, looking looking to see good value, which, of course, translates into when we when we work with our customers as well, which is they expect that from us, too. Um, and then you talk about the um, uh, the, the question about the, the the remuneration and the profit sharing. So we we've had a corporate goal as as we've referred to before, which has been constant. Huge, hugely positive feature of our company is this constant corporate goal. We all know where we're coming from. We all know what the most important thing is, and it's and it and it's dura it, it's durable. It doesn't matter what point in the economic cycle you're in, it still works. It's a peer comparison on profitability. So. Um, in the in a difficult year, this is this has been a difficult year. These last twelve months, uh, it doesn't matter to our employees uh, remuneration at the end of the year because they they worked 
far harder in this hard year than they will have done in, a, in an easier, more benign market. Um, but in a traditional um, variable compensation arrangement, they would get paid more in an easy year than they would in a hard year, arguably. So, so we have that, and that means you do the right thing for the customer all the time and, you, and your remuneration isn't affected. But we share in a reward when we meet our corporate goal. So we have a, um, a distribution scheme that gives our employees remuneration based on our performance against that goal. Um, so that, and it doesn't matter who you are in the company, it's the same amount. Um, if, we're, if we're getting it, we're all getting it and it's all the same amount as, as we go through. So that, that is a, um, a reward for all of us pulling in the same direction to that corporate goal. So there's a there's a there's a shared reward uh, as I understand it when the bank meets certain return on equity targets, and then that that builds up right. If you're a long term employee, that can be a fairly substantial uh, 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 amount of money, right? By the time you get to sixty or sixty two or something. That's definitely been the case. Yes. Yeah. So Tracy, let me ask you another question. I mean. You know, obviously, one of the strengths of the bank has been these local relationships, and that you know who to call, and and it it feels like an like like a real partnership, an intimate relationship, and and it's been this brand structure with these uh, highly empowered uh, uh, kind of lo- lo- local decision makers. Now, as we move to digital, and we you know, I've I've said like what happens when an entire industry becomes an app, and maybe that's not going to happen in banking, but certainly with payments and with these new digital digital challenger banks. We're kind of moving in that way. So, how does a very decentralized, very kind of uh, you know a, a human focused organization deal with a, a, a major new strategic challenge like this? So, how has Handelsbank and uh, with all this decentralization been been working to create you know the the, the digital tools, the apps, and so on? Uh, in because that seems to me like something that would have to be driven from the top. Yeah, I, I love the phrase you use there, Gary. You call them digital tools. And that's how we see them. So, so if you if you focus a minute on our, our sort of um, our offering to our customer, which that which they talk about in customer satisfaction surveys, which is the relationship, um, and then you presume, just like you and I, that actually you don't want to go down to the branch every day to do something. You want to be able to go online and amend your regular payments at night. You want to be able to send an email to your to your bank to get things done. Uh, maybe you want to be able to do transfers um, on your phone. You you want to be able to do all of those things but when something's important or significant to you you either want to speak to that person who knows you or you you want to be able to walk in and still meet somebody who can make decisions so we have come to the conclusion over the recent recent years um, that actually this is these are all digital tools that support our model rather than a digital revolution of our model uh, because we believe we do have customers who want what we offer and the way we offer, they tell us that, um, and they, that's how we want to support them. So if a customer wants to um, engage 95% of their time digitally, fine, then it's our job to make sure that they can do that. If they want to um, converse with us 50, 60% of the time in person, in our branch in Milton Keynes, we want them to be able to do that as well. So that's that's how we um approach this particular change in customer behavior, um, keeping it core to our offering, making it our USP, um, and not reinventing ourselves because the um, the, the trend or the narrative that, that, that's being uh, used, and, and actually there are some very successful businesses out there who are predominantly digital, and they're making that that's their business uh, design going forward, and we, we are happy to keep to ours. So in that sense, Tracy, are you saying that you think that at least for, for your customers, and I wonder if that's going to be true with, you know, the next generation of con, 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 uh, banking customers, but you're saying that you really want a hybrid model. You want to be able, when, when I want, you know, to do this digitally, I can, when I want to have, have somebody that I can talk to and, and work through something, I can. So I, it sounds like that's your premise. I guess what I would ask is, you know, uh, does that mean the branches are going to be less important? Are you going to need way fewer of them? Does you know headcount go down as uh, your customers come more and more to rely on these new digital tools? 
I don't think the two are, are definitely um, um, specifically linked. Um, we we see a difference in how our customers use our physical premises. So so we, you will see changes because of that. We listen to them. If people aren't walking through our doors, then they, they don't want to be there. Um, what's important is we can give them the relationship that they want. So an access to physical meetings um, when they want them and uh, digital, and especially even now, now that customers are more and more used to doing this kind of, of meeting. Uh, we can see more. What we have noticed, though, is our interactions customer to, to um, colleague, they are very much more about adding value to that relationship. They're about talking about future goals and ambitions and, and talking about financial planning arrangements and having deep conversations about what their goals are and how their money needs to operate in order to support that, helping them with problems rather than perhaps, um, as was in the past, how do I make this money transfer? How do I, can you please take these coins off me? Can we talk about um, how I'm going to pay my payroll? Um, so we've moved, our customers have moved us further away from that kind of transaction conversation and more to the, dare I say it, trusted advisor type relationship where we are getting involved in those conversations that really means something important to them. So, so Tracy, I know we don't have a lot more time, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that, you know, go beyond a little bit the bank uh, and in your particular experience that, you know, one is how exportable, how um, uh, replicable is, is the Handelsbank and model, right? Um, I mean, you've shown directly through your experience that you can take something that worked in Scandinavia and make it work in the UK, right, to great effect. So, so it passes maybe the geographic test, but I do wonder, like, do you see this as, um, more, you know, broadly applicable, you know, the general principles, maybe not exactly the same practices, but the general principles, do you see them are broadly applicable to banking, to, to you know, businesses with a retail component, uh, and, and more, even, even beyond? Or, or, or do you think this is kind of a niche model that, you know, won't, 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 won't generalize? Oh, I, I don't think the model of operating is specific to financial services at all. I, I, I just think it's a it's a general, um, really um, transferable business model um, that, that perhaps in less regulated organization um, operations would, would be easier to embed um, at any point in the business cycle. Um, that's me speculating. Obviously, I've only ever worked in finance. Uh, but no, if you think about the you're driving um, empowerment, trust, um, you're driving experts dealing with direct with customers to give good customer satisfaction, understanding the value of the services they're offering and running their own PL. These are all great things for industry. And, and I know I've read in, in your books, Gary, plenty of examples of, of businesses in different sectors who've done this and, and are doing it really well. So, so if that's the case, Tracy, then why are models like Handelsbank and so rare? Yes, it's it's it's, it's you've been outperforming your industry for fifty years. You think at some point, at like, some point, like maybe there's something to learn here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'd love, I'd love to um, sit in a room with with some people in other businesses and have a conversation like that because I can only speculate and and obviously I only see my my perspective of things. But when in doing that, um, I suppose I have to reflect on how did we how did we become the bank that we are now and how come we we remain this way and I and I do think it is a it is about a point in time. So we became the structure that we are right now on the back of a financial crisis in our in our home country, which prompted the board to take some dramatic decisions and to give the executive of that board, of that company, space and time and patience to roll out a strategy that they all believed in. Um, and of course, the success of that strategy, I suppose, gave them enough fuel and enough uh, motivation to carry on to a point where it was duly embedded and to something that we can sustain. Now, although we've had, um, uh, we've had other financial crises. There have obviously been time, even in a, in, in a single company situation where they can do that. Have they had the shareholder patience to, to make that change? Because it is big. Um, have they been in a position um, from a regulatory point of view when they can do something so dramatic? And I'd probably hypothesize that you wouldn't be able to do a wholesale change like that anymore in a, an industry that's regulated like financial services. But maybe you could do small changes and, and incrementally change your business towards this sort of model. I mean, that's, there's, a, there's a really important question there. Tracy, if we can take just a minute on that, um, you know, obviously financial services highly regulated, like like other businesses. I mean, most businesses they are pretty regulated. 
Um, but and, and you see a lot of, you know, the biggest banks in the world, they are spending literally billions of dollars a year on compliance. And, 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 and you are asked to, to, you know, have this kind of fairly bureaucratic uh, compliance with all the training and, all, and collecting all the data and making sure that all the checks and balances are there. Um, do, do you, I mean, obviously you operate in a legal, you know, in a set of legal constraints, but, but, but does Hanelsbanken have a different uh, 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 conversation with regulators? Uh, are, have you been able to avoid in some sense all of these compliance costs because you do have a, a model that just encourages a different attitude uh, towards risk? I think we do have the same conversations with regulators as everyone else. We follow the same guidelines and, and rules. Our operating model means that um, the point at which certain activities happen is in a different place. So, uh, you know, if they, um, if you have a centralized credit team or centralized credit function, um, then you know that your credit decisions are assessed on a central level. With us, it's it's at the branches, um, but they're following a, po a policy and a procedure. So, um, each bank has a different way of, of employees engaged in different activities. Some look like us and some don't. Uh, so I don't think our model particularly tells you something there. Um, just that we are able to operate in this model in a regulated environment. So uh, it is it is possible. Presumably you have lower compliance costs, right? You do not have, you know, so many layers of, of you know, so much internal audit functions and 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 and, and people uh, you know exercising oversight and so that's kind of more built into your model that it is you know a huge large staff uh, uh, function as, as I understand it. Yeah, and I think I would uh, you you use the phrase before you you have a bank full of risk managers. Well, we also have a um, a bank full of self auditors. You know, we we are all responsible for our aspects of work that we're doing. So we are we are controlling our own activities and, and also knowing what will be measured around and ensuring that we capture the right thing. So the activity is exactly the same in our bank compared to another, but ultimately it could be being carried out by different people with different titles. Great. I think we're running out of time, Tracy. I, I wish I could ask you a couple more questions, but maybe we'll leave that to another, uh, another session uh, where we can go a little bit deeper, but you've just uh, helped us, you know, get, kind of granular on some very important aspects of the Handelsbanken uh, model and, and, and showed us that, you know, it is possible to, to do this, even in the highly regulated industry, and that, you know, all companies should really look at you and, and what you're doing as, as an example to improve, you know, the customer experience, improve their economic output and productivity, as well as the lives of the people working inside them. So thank you for such an inspiring uh, set of insights and, uh, you know, I uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Well, thank you so much for your interest, Michaeli and Gary. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.